All right, so that's us. That's we're behind the scenes. So uh, that's Colin in the middle, Jay on the left, me on the right. If you can't read the names below, and um, if you need our email addresses or want to contact us, Jay can put them into the uh, uh, to the, the responses for everybody. In fact, we'll have Jay send those out. I always um, try and put this in here to remind people that most of the stuff that I provide for you is at retrotech.com. Their website is constantly updating. In fact, most of the images in the background have already changed. There is a link to register for the multi-fan course on their main page, and all of the documents that I'll include today all come from their uh, support page. So under support, you can get your manuals and guides, um, some of the ones we have here today, and I have a special link for you for large buildings for everybody today. Um, and you can also get uh, more information about webinars. If you have suggestions for next year's webinars, because today is our last one for the year, uh, please do not hesitate to give us your feedback or what you'd like to hear or hear more of. Um, that would be excellent. The guides in the manual, I can't uh, uh, highlight them enough on how uh, 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 proactive they are and how they actually do a great QA. Uh, they are a visual and checkbox step through on how to do stuff. And uh, the manuals are an in-depth knowledge of the topics themselves. So on the bottom right is the ones we'll focus on uh, for some of the images today and some of the information. But uh, there's a nice library here that's available for anybody who's looking for more information. The multi-fan manual, um, uh, Jason and give you this PDF link. It is under the support uh, page under uh, manuals and guides. The multi-fan manual uh, is a wealth of information. And some of the images I have later come directly out of this document. It's a PDF document. The other one that I have here in the bottom is not even open to the public. So any of you that are here today, you are able to benefit from going to registrech.com, support, and then enter the word articles um, in the URL at the top. And it will take you to a variety of large building articles that haven't been able to get published on the website yet. So I contacted them today and they said they at least have a working uh, page. So many of the great articles that Colin has written are there for your download, and he says it's available for public use, just needs to get cleaned up. So you cannot directly access it from retrotech.com, but if you type in articles or Jay should send you the link, you'll be able to access a variety of articles that are uh, not yet published uh, or not yet available on the website. If you do have a DM32 gauge, the firmware is currently version 49. Uh, the firmware for the gauge updates fairly regularly. So if you have a gauge, it's not like every six months or a year like your router or other things may be. They actually are really on top of keeping up with um, you know, changes, alterations, new equipment. So you definitely want to uh, open your configurator and plug in your gauge with USB, and it'll tell you if you need to update or not. So right now, version 49 is the current version. Also, I, I'm trying to plug that there is a, a way to uh, upgrade your uh, DG700 or your DM2 um, for the new DM32. Um, many people aren't aware of the upgrade. If you really want to uh, move the route of the new gauge, this is a significant discount. And you can contact sales at retrotech.com for that. Um, so it is a RetroTech webinar, so I do try and plug many of their stuff, obviously. So this is the training that we want to talk about today and talk about what will be in the actual training itself. So we try to use the term multi-fan versus multi-family or large building because once you've gone past one fan or six fans or 12 fans, you've entered a whole nother uh, avenue of testing and, and challenges or issues that come along with that type of setup. So um, it is in um, Seattle, uh, it is on February 4th and 5th. I believe that's a Wednesday and Thursday. And it is actually in the same uh, location as the ACI conference. If you may be attending that, that's on Monday and Tuesday. And this will be on the top floor of, uh, of that on Wednesday and Thursday. Um, the price is on the on the sheet here. You can do it when you register, but it's only fourteen seventy five. That's a one thousand four hundred seventy five dollars. That's about half of what this cost several years ago when they did it, and it was a sold out class. Uh, they only allow sixty seats, and uh, people from all over the world attend this type of training. Uh, when you leave this training, not only will you understand how to use 
two blower doors or six blower doors. You'll understand how to use their software, uh, but you'll really have a total knowledge and uh, understanding of pressure and flow and building dynamics, whether it's a you know regular house even or some of these larger structures that some of us do or want to do more of. You really will understand the, the pressure dynamics that happen in these and how to test them and what are the challenges and how to overcome those and identify them quickly and what are the better and smarter setups. So we really feel it's a great, uh, a great opportunity to be able to offer this course. We do have, so here's some things that will be covered in the course directly. It's two days lunch, how to use automated software, fluctuating baselines, um, check your gauge diagnostics, you know, pre-select fans, uh, how many fans are required, troubleshooting um, your uh, fan up to 24 fans or um, control issues. So these are all the things we're actually going to be covering. It's mostly about how to do a test. Um, you could spend another week on about all the different types of buildings and all the, the nuances, but we will cover them in a very brief, probably a one hour um, understanding that you should definitely make sure you have your engineer and other people on board uh, in order to do some of these larger structures. Today, I want to focus on some things that will be in the course, um, like ambient natural pressures, um, some neutral pressurization uh, testing methods, and fan setup challenges when you actually are dealing with two or more fans and some of the challenges that those actually can have. One of the things that I'll, I'll dig into first is about um, at the hotel, um, I, I don't have a picture, but I think it's like a 30-story hotel. It's the large uh, downtown hotel. And we're going to try and set up a variety of uh, tubing throughout the structure that allows you to do uh, a variety of tests because we'll be on the top floor for the training. And we're going to run some tubing that will try and get to the outside from either the roof and or all the way down the stairs. Um, so people will be able to have a chance to actually go through the building and do some natural ambient uh, diagnostics. Uh, we feel I edited an article for uh, RetroTech uh, last week that will be in the NEB um, uh, mailer that they have coming out that just talks about really starting with ambient uh, conditions. That You actually just go around with your gauge and some tubing that's connected to the outside and evaluate uh, how connected is uh, some of the units, what type of stack effect are you reading, um, what are, where are the, the stairs, what's inside, what's outside. There's a variety of stuff that can be covered and really mapped out well about how the building functions under normal conditions with just a gauge and a variety of long tubes that are getting you to uh, other parts of the building at one time. So uh, we're going to kind of go through this as, in the beginning of the course, um, but you'll kind of get an understanding as to uh, you actually can do a lot on a commercial structure or multifamily with just your gauge alone if there are also conditions that you're trying to diagnose uh, for an existing structure. So again, we're just going to go through and uh, one of the ways to focus is to be focusing on the low sections and high sections of the, uh, of the uh, structure uh, or individual rooms really. So um, there's a little tiny little brass or metal pressure probes. RetroTech includes one in their kit. And usually you can either drill a small hole or actually find a, a small opening somewhere and try and put your probe in the walls in high and low spots to determine what's happening. Even just measuring this room compared to the next unit or the hallway will give you a lot of information that's actually incredibly valuable. It helps you determine where the air barrier is. Um, you know, if it's a really windy day, this is not the kind of test to be doing because you're going to be affected by that. And there's a variety of stuff that other will also impact it. If I'm doing a, you know, a four-story building uh, that has a lot of glass exposure and it's a really sunny day, the temperature and the solar effects are going to be uh, affecting that. If I'm doing a 30-story building, I need to understand what's the stack effect happening throughout the structure. So I actually can include that on what kind of measurements I'm getting on each floor or each individual units. So if we take a, a large structure, some things I want to find out is, is there a connection from a parking garage um, to the lobby or the interior? Um, you know, th all these things are all connected. The question is, is that how connected are they or what kind of issues am I having? There's enormous amount of penetrations that go through from just trying to do makeup air, combustion air, uh, for a variety of appliances. Is the mechanical room inside or outside um, the air barrier? Um, so 
even if we're going around the gauge, I can actually help determine some of these issues that are actually happening uh, in any kind of structure that we have or we'd be evaluating. Um, you can get a really good understanding as to how well uh, and how effective some of the mechanical pressures and mechanical ventilation is. Um, a lot of systems now, a lot of units, uh, you know, multifamily do not have their own individual fans. They're actually the single source fan that's now using an ASHRAE standard to, you know, create a negative pressure constantly. Um, and that actually has a lot of dynamics that it has on the entire structure from the hallway um, to the common areas uh, to individual units. And uh, you can easily understand what these pressures are. So the, you know, the natural and mechanical that, you know, you'll really understand and visually how well the structure is working and it looks a lot like a, uh, the chimney effect or what kind of happening in the structure. So again, that's one of the things we'll be doing and playing. This is actually a very fun exercise with a large building and the fact that somebody else set up a bunch of tubing for you um, that you can then actually, uh, you know, diagnose the, the structure with. So the other things we'll also be covering are a variety of the testing standards um, from uh, ASTM to Army Corps of Engineers and uh, others on when do you need them, which one are you going for, how they actually apply. Uh, sometimes you can only depressurize versus pressurize. Um, what are some of the conditions that are required versus what you actually can do? What are the limitations of wind and temperature? And all of the large buildings um, that are out there you are multifamily at this level we don't actually uh, test the way we do with residential it's no longer an air changes per hour and a volume or is it a square footage um, for duct testing or a surface area for duct testing um, here everything is surface area of the entire structure itself so it looks more about what is the actual surface area um, of the structure and in general, you're trying to get around uh, 0 0.4 CFM per square foot is the standard that actually have, is in Seattle. Uh, Army Corps of Engineers is 0 0.25 CFM per square foot. So um, most people actually are doing those kind of tests have uh, easily exceeded, you know, gotten much lower than these uh, test requirements. But at first, it is a challenge. So. A lot of things we'll be talking about no longer deal, again, with volume or square footage. It's about surface area. Um, I do have a couple of polls. Usually I throw them out uh, early, but we'll find out uh, who's actually here today real quick. Um, lately, several people have been responding rapidly, so we go through these in less than 30, 40 seconds. So um, give us your votes real quick, and we can uh, move on to uh, a couple other questions and get back here. So um, kind of actors is, is – um, what kind of system commissioning would also be people that are doing the large building testing already, um, or you know, the BET is actually uh, a NEB certification directly, but all those are kind of overlap. Um, weatherization folks, uh, quality assurance, quality control. If there's something that clearly did not fit your uh, criteria, uh, throw it in the questions. A lot of times we have uh, uh, architects, design professionals, code officials, just regular auditors, um, so if something didn't fit, that would uh, just throw it in there. We got can I? I have an idea about who's here, and make sure I address some of your actual concerns. Uh, Steve says he's almost all of them. So that's right. A couple other are. I have a state program trainer, uh, Doug. Thanks for joining us. So um, yeah, if there's anything else that's out there, it helps me uh, keep in the back of the mind some other perspectives that are there. All right, I'm almost at 80. Give me a few more votes. Three, two, one. All right, I'll wrap this up. Here's what we got. So the majority of people are uh, building enclosure testing folks. So if you have taken the NEB course, um, we do not market people directly. I'm not going to send you an email, nor a RetroTech, but it helps me understand if you've already taken the, the, the NEB course, chime in. Let me know if you've taken that. So I do know that a lot of that was very um, uh, lecture orientated and uh, test, but it, there was no field or – uh, practical training that went along with that. So uh, if that fits you, then we'd like to hear more about uh, your experience. So, all right, great. I'll hide those and oh, let's go with – all right, so here's a question is how many fans do you need to test? Um, I'm trying to see the visual. I can't see my screen real quick. 
Oh, how many feet do you need to test if you have a three-story um, building? And the surface area is around 96,000 square feet. In general, that's probably about a uh, three to four-story um, multi-fan, a multi multi-family uh, setup, maybe uh, four um, units on each floor is kind of kind of a ballpark of what that would visualize. So I wanted to find out what uh, people were guessing. We're going to try to add some quiz kind of questions in the future. So we thought we'd you know throw this out. Um, you know, if you don't know, that's fine. Uh, I would not have been able to answer it um, that easily, but uh, of course, I made the webinar and have an idea. So, a few more votes. Um, this is not part of any kind of uh, uh, confirmation or uh, assessment in any way. So, all right, I will close it out. And so, um, the majority of people were said, uh, I have no idea. That's okay. Um, several people were uh, high on the three. Some people thought four. And um, a few people were on the other spectrum. So the average answer in, in that ballpark is three. If you're ever going to need a test that requires three, you would, of course, have four fans. So maybe it's a, a, it's a trick question. Um, and uh, you always need to have a spare in the backup in case you want to have a challenge with one of your fans and you are going to charge a lot of money for the test, you want to make sure you're successful in one day. So um, again, the average would have been around three to four and uh, we'll explain how that actually uh, gets played out. All right, that didn't work very well, but you got the idea. So um, you can download a uh, number of fans calculator. Um, the link will be sent to you in the, the webinar here. It is actually under software uh, at the top under support. Instead of going to the webinars or the, the documents, you actually can go to the software. And it actually is a basic spreadsheet that gives you uh, the ability to calculate um, based upon surface area, um, how many fans you would need depending on what kind of fans you had. So it actually kind of talks you through that and confirms that you have enough fans to uh, complete the job. And it also depends on what kind of standard you may be testing to. Um, and you m must be prepared to have additional fans sometimes for larger structures because you really want to at least get to the test pressure. Uh, and if it's a leaky building, you would need more fans to do that, obviously. So if I needed for sure four fans, I may feel like I should have five for sure, maybe six, because I need to know what the real leakage is in case they're failing um, so we can actually address that. So one of the things we'll cover next are some neutral pressure um, options. Um, some people call this guarded. We think that that's um, not really the best term because we're really actually neutralizing pressure or an area so that we can actually evaluate one part of a section that's usually connected. So um, one of the ways that this comes into play, if I want to actually measure a, in a multifamily unit, I need to measure a single individual unit or a structure, an apartment, somebody's condo, and um, but I don't really want to uh, have leakage that's to the units that are adjacent. I really want to focus on one unit. So I can actually isolate the units that are on the right and left sides um, by actually creating pressures that neutralize um, the pressure that I'm actually testing at. So um, clearly testing one large um, uh, you know, unit or one large area, one large building, I can easily determine the number of fans. I may need to have two locations, but this is a very uh, basic and common type. Okay, I can, I understand this type of test. But if I really want to try and find out on the third floor, uh, the unit here, we'll call it unit uh, three, is what's the leakage here? And my, my goal is to try and find out um, what is their total CFM leakage. So I can, uh, for today, we'll, we'll use the fact that I'm going to be pressurizing so we can actually visualize where the air flows to. So I set up my fan in the uh, uh, main door of the unit. I need to make sure that the uh, units on each side actually have uh, are opened to uh, the outside. So when the pressure leaves the, the unit I'm testing, it has somewhere to go and somewhere to move on to. Otherwise, those actually become a, an air a blockage or become um, a wall that I'm trying not to uh, measure. I want to measure how much leakage totally goes from this unit 
to the outside. So you can visualize it's easy to set up a door. This is a common test many of us have done. And, uh, and my total results, results were 1,200 CFM. All right, so I want to find out what are the leakage to the right, left, up, and down, and hallway, because the hallway is actually a connected uh, wall in this case, and subtract that. And I'll, when I'm done, I'll actually find out what is the leakage to this individual unit. This could be trying to determine the leakage for an individual floor or um, an individual client's uh, setup or condition. So it has a lot of different applications. So in general, this is just kind of a way that you actually would do a multifamily test for an individual unit for uh, occupancy for some codes. All right, so here I have my, um, my test setup, and I'm actually pressurizing one unit. I add a... Uh, blower door to the uh, to the hallway, All right? And now I'm actually able to eliminate because I'll have a neutral pressure across the common wall, and uh, able to actually uh, determine what kind of leakage is going across that. And then I actually have a um, uh, a number that I can actually now subtract. So I had a, a 100 CFM. And uh, that's going across the common wall there, All right? So we go to the next stage. And what I can now do is oh, – there's, there's my 3D visualization. So I can now – I added the hallway with pressure, and now I've eliminated the wall that's between them. Now I can actually go to the unit on the right and actually pressurize it by just opening the door sometimes because I'm actually pressurizing already with the fan here. So if I open the door, I can now actually um, – create a pressure. My goal is to make sure that the pressure is the same. So I have a, uh, the same pressure going across this wall, right, as I did across the hallway. All right, so now I can eliminate that. So that was also, uh, that was 200 CFM going to the unit to the right. All right, and now I can actually also do the uh, uh, unit on the left also. So my goal is to actually work around. So with the only, only just two fans um, I can actually uh, figure out what kind of leakage I have to what side and um, which one actually is my most significant area. And you also can do it to the uh, uh, unit above and below if you have units above and below. So when it's all said and done, I'd be like, oh, this unit only leaks 300, 750 CFM, but my initial results were 1,200. So now I know that I have leakage to other units or other connections that are also uh, – significant issue. So that's definitely something you uh, would want to address. Check and see any questions. All right. So one of these we will cover in depth in the um, uh, uh, training itself is uh, fantastic software and all the things that this does that are pretty phenomenal. Um, and, uh, Hey, Colin, can you mute your uh, mic? He told me to turn my mic on if I wanted to say something. Oh, okay. Yeah, I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't tell if it was on or not. Okay, Go ahead, uh, please. Okay, I just wanted to say that the uh, hookup diagram for that is not super obvious, but it's on page eleven of the free uh, multi-fan manual, um, and you can actually, if you've got two small adjacent buildings, you can actually try this, or even two cardboard boxes. You, you can actually try this yourself uh, on a smaller scale before you kind of go wild with it. But because that was a great graphic you created there, Joe. Thanks. Anyway, I'm done. Oh, well, yeah, you'll be back in a minute. I got some other stuff for you, Colin. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So um, we did a webinar a while ago on Fantastic. I'm not going to uh, delve into all the details that it does, but what it does do is – automatically find your gauges. You can determine what standard you want to test to, all right? And that standard will then determine um, what type of parameters, how many multi-points, um, all of the conditions that have to be met for that standard, whether it's Army Corps or uh, ASTM 779 or uh, whatever standard you're following. And then I can basically can say, run test. And it will fully automatically do all the things that you need to do in order to complete uh, the test and give you um, results at the end 
stating whether you really pass by completing all the details of the test. The test may require you know, pressurization and depressurization. And if you only did one, it says, well, you did not complete this. Um, so you understand the conditions that the test uh, required officially, whether you and your client decided to not do some of those tests due to a variety of situations. If you had a, you know, a clean room environment or a uh, you know, hospital type room, a lot of times you may not end up pressurizing the structure due to uh, conditions that may be outside that you did not want to bring in uh, or depends on the a variety of issues, just to be blunt. So, um, and it also creates a customized report for you that uh, is customized based upon the, again, the standard that you tested to. Um, so all the parameters that were required in there get listed in a customized um, Word document and it can be created into a PDF and you can uh, alter that so it is specific with not just your logo, but how you would want it to read, like uh, based upon blah, 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 your kind of verbiage can be altered for uh, your exact uh, phrase, language, uh, whatever works for you best. So um, we will definitely make sure that when everybody leaves, um, they will understand how to use Fantastic uh, in any possible way, whether it's one fan, three fans, or up to 24 fans. And the one thing you will get at the training is a chance to play with a room full of fans and how to do a large um, multi fan test with, you know, at one point we'll be staging it so that you'll do a lot of practices with just um, potentially three fans, but um, we'll restage it. So the next day at one point you'll be able to see what happens when we have, you know, a whole line of, of fans and what are the challenges when you actually have multiple fans that are doing different zones, uh, different, different zones could be like I showed before, uh, an individual unit, or they could be different floors or different parts of the floor that we're trying to make sure we uh, we have a uh, pressurized or depressurized correctly. So um, again, there's a variety of uh, in-depth knowledge that comes in with Fantastic. If anybody who signs up, we'll be definitely sending out uh, information ahead of time as to um, you know how to. Uh, come in prepared as much as you want to be on how to use the, the software uh, and how to do some of the setups and make sure you understand all of the different uh, uh, you know, options that are there. So, uh, but if you sign up at the last minute, we'll be ready for you also. So there's two different ways that you can actually take multiple fans and connect them. All right. So one way is to actually, if you look at your fan, many of the fans you own, um, should have a two Ethernet ports on the side. That means that I can actually go into one side uh, with my gauge and control it, and I can come out and I can go to another fan and come out and go to another fan and so on. So in this setup here, the gauge at the top is actually controlling all of the fans that are in the picture. There is a gauge here, on, here and here that actually are reading pressures. I didn't draw their tubing, um, the green uh, and the uh, uh, yellow, that actually will read the pressures from each fan. But the fact is that the, the fan speed is now being controlled by this one gauge, and all the fan speeds are now trying to match each other. So this is one way to you can set up your fans. Another way is in parallel, where each gauge is controlling – uh, each individual fan, <clears throat> pardon me, based upon its own pressure and its own readings, right? Both of these have their own best applications and can sometimes give you challenges uh, if you're not uh, careful with uh, how you're running your test. One of the challenges that can happen is that you can end up with uh, fans that are all trying to pressurize one zone, and if they didn't come on or they didn't run at the right speed together, Next thing you know, I have uh, one of my fans is either maybe not running at all or running backwards because it's actually has some pressure that's coming in and coming back out. So it's actually now running backwards or just spinning backwards. And you can't really tell if it's actually on or not because it will measure flow. It will actually give you some results because the fan is actually spinning around. All right. So this is one of the challenges that happens. And this could be on your fifth floor of a five-story uh, test. And you may not be aware of it because you sense that you have flow. The fantastic software understands this is actually a, a risk and a challenge, and they've overcome this in the software itself. So this is one of the things you want to be careful of because I'm actually doing 
a parallel system. They each have their own speed. Um, but again, some fans may not actually uh, kick on. People that do large um, structures, you know, like uh, airport hangars or multi, where they have like, you know, 20, 30, 40 fans, um, they actually use an infrared gun. Then they'll go round, and if the, clearly the fan is cold, it's not spinning. Even if the blades are moving, um, it's actually either moving the wrong way or it's actually it's not actually activated. So it's one way they actually use as a, a QA process to confirm that the fans are uh, doing what they should be. So now that I can actually have individual control, um, I can actually now determine that they're both going to be on the same speed, even though they actually have their own control uh, connected. The software can actually help compensate that. So it's a great feature that's uh, inherent and built into the uh, fantastic software. So another example is if I have um, zones that are um, next to each uh, Let's just say this is on the first floor. Zone one's on the first floor and zone two maybe on the third floor or the fifth floor, right? So again, my goal is to make sure that uh, it's sometimes I may need different speeds in order to get different pressures in order to actually accomplish the test itself. Uh, so if I did have them both on the same speed, um, one may actually get to the pressure it needed to for that floor, but on another floor, the same speed may not actually be enough pressure to actually uh, get to 75 or 50 pascals, depending on your test requirements. So then I can take off individual control and I can do that. So all this is inherent in the software itself, but sometimes people may do a two-fan test or do something similar, and you want to be careful or cautious about how you set up your fans or how you may be running them. Uh, here's where it comes into play. Um, again, much more larger, we have multiple fans. So if I actually have one zone here and I may need three fans for this zone and uh, three other fans for that zone, um, one of the challenges may be if I've set them up to be um, individual or um, actually run parallel, that I can still have the same issue I had before on one floor where one of the fans in that zone may be a challenge. Yeah, Colin. Uh, yeah, in the I was just about to say in the picture that you showed there, you get common control by sending a common control signal to each fan. But two slides back, I think you showed individual control, and it should have been unchecked. Um, that yeah, one back from that. Uh, I was wrong. Okay. <laughs> Oh, yeah, and in, in, in that one, you're showing individual control is wrong, right? Uh, on the slide that's on the screen now? Uh, no, no. Go ahead. Why don't you clarify? Okay, so there's individual control and there's common control. Common control means all the fans are running at the same speed, and you always want common control and the fans are blowing in the same volume. Individual control means each fan is controlling to its own pressure, and since the pressure they're controlling to is the same, one fan is likely to take off, the other one keeps slowing down. So in a case like this where you have two fans blowing into the same space, the best way to do it is to wire them together so one control signal goes for one fan and the daisy chains into the next, and our fans are all set up for that. If you don't want to do that, you can go into the software and you can uncheck individual control. That will give you common control, and the one master gauge will send the same control signal to the other gauge and it won't actually try and control to pressure. Great, thanks. Uh, there's a, it's pretty well covered in our manual, but it's an area, probably the one single thing that everybody makes a mistake, even like the super engineers, the PhDs and stuff, they all make this mistake and they say, oh, there's something wrong with that fan. It kept, it kept slowing down and slowing down and eventually it shut off. And I said, well, where was your control set? And I go, ah. Eh. So it's really important to get it to uh, two fans running in the same space, get them messing up so that one is taking over, and then uh, uncheck individual control, see how that fixes it, or wire the same control signal from one fan to the next, see how that fixes it. Then you've seen the problem, you've solved the problem, and it'll never uh, happen again on one of your jobs. Do you want to continue with some of the slides I have here? 
Uh, no, I, I thought you were doing a great job. I just that one. Uh, I get messed up with that too. Apparently, there's something in our software where we can't actually change the name, but we figured out a way to do that. So in an upcoming version, we'll say common control or individual control instead of lack of indo individual control is now common control, and that's I forget that all the time. So I mean, it's a mistake everybody makes. So we're going to clarify that in the software just to make it a little bit easier. Uh, yeah. There's also a video we have on that as well. I'm not sure if the video is on our website or not. It might be. If someone wants to see it, we can uh, uh, see if we can arrange that. But it's good to see the video that shows this exercise on common control and individual control. And I actually show two fans messing up, and then I fix it by wiring them differently. But, yeah, go ahead. Uh, one of the questions was, Colin, can you kind of uh, briefly uh, do an overview of that one more time? Uh, people are, I got several questions here and they're like, well, that went by really fast. So I think they'd like to just hear again, your explanation as to when as a fan could run backwards and, um, how to, what are the options of correcting that? Well, probably the best way to think of it is whenever you have two or more fans blowing into a common volume, then those fans have got to be linked together. Ideally, you take a chain and strap them together so the fan blades would be totally synchronized and they'd all move together. But since we're electronic, we can't do that. The easy way that we can do that with our fans, and you know absolutely that each fan is running like one big fan, and when you turn fan number one up to 10%, fan number two, three, four, five, six, all goes up to 10%, is to take your control signal from your master gauge and you identify which one that is and uh, you go into your fan number one and then there's a second uh, Ethernet port on there that's uh, uh, that allows you to daisy chain to fan number two and then you another Ethernet port on that one allows you to daisy chain to fan number three and so on so that every fan is getting exactly the same signal so the other gauges are actually putting out control signals, but you're ignoring them because you have no no control signal wire attached to that fan. So that's common control when you're dealing with fans blowing in the same space. The other alternative, let's say you've got fans at the top of the building, you've got fans at the bottom of the building, and the top of the building, let's say, is twice as tight as the bottom of the building. Well, the fans at the top may be running at 33%, the fans at the bottom may be running at 66% but they're not pneumatically connected. As we put pressure on the top floor, it doesn't actually work its way down to the first floor very well. So each one of those fans would be running on its own control signal, which would be individual control for the top floor, individual control for the bottom floor. So all the fans on the top floor would be daisy chained together because they're all working as one unit and they have their own individual control signal. They're trying to set, let's say, the pressure to 50. All the fans you have on the first floor will all be daisy chains together. They will also be working on their own set pressure, which might be 50, and then you have a very happy situation. So, uh, as I said, the, like the way to understand this is to try and exercise, and you don't need a big building. You can actually get, I, I often do this with two duct testers. I just take two cardboard boxes and I put them together, uh, and I run them into the same space, and then I disconnect them so I can see it. And uh, we have an exercise for this that we'd be happy to send you. Thank you. One of the questions that I saw that came up was, was um, somebody was doing a recent test, a uh, four-fan test, and they had um, three DM32s, and they still had one DM2, and they said they had a hard time getting it to connect. So uh, that was Ken. So um, one of my questions can be is that well, you can actually connect the the DM32 with an Ethernet, but the older DM2 still has to use a USB connection, and USB connection is limited to around 15 feet. You can kind of get a uh, something that will boost the signal, but your max is only about 45 feet away. So I don't know where the DM2 was located um, or how you had it connected. So the reality is that I don't know if it was um, – maybe that answers your question or you can recall what your setup was. But you can actually use the, the software to use either of the gauges. Um, you know, you, it is technically possible to use Wi-Fi. Um, Colin and I kind of really 
agree that it is always best to wire your gauge. It just reduces hiccups, challenges, other glitches. I know it's wired. I know it stays connected. And there's a variety of uh, hubs that bring everything together. And then out of that, it goes into a router, which assigns numbers to everything. And the software can uh, pick all that up. Go ahead, Colin. Uh, on the DM32, the, the USB is reliable 6, 8, maybe 10 feet or so. That's about it. Um, when you've got a number of fans running, you've got a lot of electromagnetic stuff flying around, so things aren't as easy uh, to accomplish as they would be with just one fan and one gauge. So um, th the ideal situation would be to have all the same gauge, and I really like using the Ethernet cable on the DM32 because you can run for hundreds of feet with it with no problem. The cable's cheap. You can actually run, I think, as many as 20 fans on one Ethernet cable. So it really does make it nice. Uh, but the, the software does work with both gauges, but there can be challenges. The, there's another really important thing you should do if you've got different fans is that you should take a very careful look in the multi-fan manual that's got a wall of diagrams that shows you how to hook up every one and you have to read at the top and make sure you identify what controls you have and what splitters you have for those uh, components and make sure that you choose the right uh, diagram for the equipment you have and if you have any doubts contact our tech support and they will uh, sure that you get it hooked up right because you can get all kinds of weird ground loops in there and so on if you've got equipment that doesn't match. That's it. So these are some of the other diagrams that are available out there on what you're setting up or how you may um, run your equipment. So. Uh, one of the things that I will um, point out on the where we're headed um, in terms of the uh, – I feel the industry is on a variety of levels, whether it's residential, commercial, um, testing has finally uh, entered its way into the industry in terms of uh, more code acceptance, more code requirements, uh, more diagnostic <clears throat> possibilities. And um, for many of you, it's you, you're, you've been doing well with it. Um, others always we always wish that there was a, a variety or a much larger uh, application. Um, I do feel as though the uh, the future of who can do testing is based upon some certification. So I got no no brainer there. Some applications don't really have a clear identifying certification, or code is very uh, ambiguous about that. <laughs> Pardon me. One of the things that's headed. Um, uh, and becoming more acceptable is a manufacturer, a nationally recognized manufacturer certification. So right now, um, uh, Air Bear Association has a, uh, a manual and a guide, and I'm sure they're working on a certification. Um, NEB also has a certification for building envelope tester. And many of them are um, sometimes only the, the technical aspect, not necessarily the field or practical. So this is a, a, a perfect complement to those other certifications, as well as uh, we feel in the future, this will be um, just as much or uh, just as strong of a certification to be a requirement to do some of the testing that's out there. Um, I know the ICC Code uh, Review Committee discussed about testing larger buildings like Seattle does and other uh, some communities, but they felt that there weren't enough people. The Army was yet not there in order to mandate that kind of testing. So the more and more people that are trained, the more and more certifications that are out there, then, <coughs> pardon me, the more this becomes a possibility for people to, uh, uh, for become a requirement, and uh, more and more testings of buildings will be get tested. So, um, yeah, I can't say enough about your opportunity uh, that we have here, and uh, it's only sixty seats, and uh, we gladly uh, would welcome any questions you have now or uh, anytime in the future. You can contact uh, myself, Jay, or Colin directly, or sales at retrotech.com and we'll make sure the right people get back to you. Uh, a couple questions here I want to try and follow up with. Um, one of the questions was you had the uh, older software. I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about the older um, Fantastic and uh, had to choose the lead DM. Uh, still the same 
I guess that's what the better question is. Uh, so yeah, I'm trying to. Uh, so uh, yeah, you, you confirm he does have the older version. I uh, highly recommend you update for sure. Uh, there's been some drastic improvements, even as the last six months for Fantastic that uh, overcome some, you know, much more user friendly, some much more um, sophisticated solutions for the user. And uh, when you say choose the lead uh, DM, do you mean like choose the main uh, gauge? Is that what you're asking about, Steve? So in the uh, in the software, fantastic. It asks you to like uh, pick the controlling um, uh, manometer so that I can actually uh, have one that's reading. Um, so for here's an example. So on the top right, it's the control uh, cable. And next to that would say that this is the gauge that I'm actually uh, taking the readings and using it for other fans possibly. Right. So usually on the software, it's the top fan or the top uh, gauge that says, okay, if I'm going to use one gauge to control others, it would be this. So um, that's still the same. And that's still a, what actually allows you to do individual control and other options is to say, even if I do have uh, individual connections, if I wanted to, I could make this one gauge, the one that actually allowed them all to go to the same speeds, all in the software itself. So, um, depending on what your scenario was or what your challenges were, that can actually be a very uh, powerful and easy uh, changeover right in the software. Yes, hey, Joe, can I, can I just talk about that for a sec? Yeah. Um, we have a number of names. Uh, on the software, we actually call it the primary gauge and the primary fan. So in this uh, picture here, I guess it would be the one in the upper left-hand corner. And what the primary gauge is, is it's the one that's receiving the pressure signal that you're actually controlling to and you're um, striving to accomplish. So let's say you're doing it, an Army Corps test, you're going from 75 pascals down to 40, let's say. So uh, if you gave eight gauges, uh, eight different requirements to go to 75, they'd be arguing back and forth. So you have to choose one and tell that one to go to 75. Uh, I've got an interesting little spreadsheet that allows you to um, do a model of the building you're going to test ahead of time and then figure out from that which one should be your primary gauge. So a situation might be, for example, where you've got a 20-story building, let's say, and you've got a lot of leaks on the main floor, you've got a lot of leaks on the top floor, you have to maintain the pressure in that building within plus minus uh, 10%. So what you might do there is you might choose your primary gauge to be the one that's on the fourth floor. So that way, you know, maybe the top floor is going to be uh, minus 5%, the bottom floor is going to be plus 5%, that kind of thing. Uh, so you may have to juggle around a bit as to which one you want to call the primary gauge. And in our software, you can uh, move the gauges around. There's a little arrow if you've got more than one gauge earmarked. And you can move the gauges up and down on the list, and you can uh, essentially choose any gauge that you want in your entire system to be the primary gauge. And that's the one that, uh, you know, when you say, I got so much flow at 75 pascals, if that gauge reads 75 pascals, that's the one you're controlling to, and the rest of them are kind of slaves to that particular gauge. Did that help your question? Steve says, yes, great, thanks. So if anybody wants to um, play with the software, uh, fantastic. There is a free version uh, you can download, and it does one fan, and it does not create uh, customized reports, um, but you can actually get a full feel and run your test automatically. And if you want to upgrade to uh, two fans or four fans or six, they have different licenses uh, that allow you to add more fans in that. So um, if you want to get a feel for how the software works, um, that's definitely the easiest uh, path to do. There are some uh, webinars that were recorded that are on our YouTube channel, and uh, there's some documents online to help you uh, go through the uh, learning the new software process. Colin, is there anything you want to add to the uh, training, or can you uh, talk about some of the successes you had at the last uh, training we had? Well, um the more that people know before they get there, the better. So um, to show up and expect us to teach you everything in two days is difficult. We have uh, at least one of the testers that would be there 
has done almost 400 large buildings with our fans over a period of about six or seven years. Uh, another tester has been there uh, that will be there has done 25 or 30 and they still phone us and ask us questions so it's an ongoing uh, process. The more you experiment and the more you play around and have questions to bring to something like that, the better. And uh, I'm not saying you need to come to a course necessarily to learn this stuff. Uh, there's one uh, Pi Forensics, they are a bunch of brilliant PhDs, they actually wrote their own software package and so on and you know they just do it all. Um, but for most people that would take us a month of Sundays. Uh, however, uh, there's still things that they could have picked up there and they still have you know fallen in a few black holes as a result. So one of the biggest things and the toughest things to really get a, a handle on is the effect of wind uh, on your pressure gauges and we have a free data logger and what I would suggest is that you spend some time experimenting with different tubing configurations like you might have one short tube, you might have one long tube, you might have one one skinny tube, you might have one on the windward side, one on the downwind side of the building, and just log those pressures. We recently did a round of testing that was meant to prove out, which I think will be the, a new standard for testing large buildings. We've been working on it for about four years now. And we had some horrendous problems with uh, wind, and you can't learn enough about wind. I did a six-month study on wind on one building where I tested it hundreds of times and I'm still learning about wind. So you really need to be able to differentiate the difference between wind and stack. So I also messed around this building and I wandered around inside the building with this hose. It seemed no matter where I put the hose, I didn't change the pressure. I thought it would, but it didn't. So stack is only affected by the portion of the building through which the tubing passes. It seems counterintuitive, but you've got to learn that so that you know when you're on the job, is it stack that's affecting me? Is it wind? Is it the HVAC system that's turned on? Is someone standing on the tube? All those things need to be second nature because when you've got two, four, eight, or 20 gauges running, you've got to know this stuff really, really well and know exactly what that gauge is going to do. So that would be my um, advice to you. Uh, if you do decide to, uh, to come to our course, we're going to be doing it in a, and I think a different and quite a revolutionary way. Uh, mostly because having trained people for 30 some years on how to use blower doors, I realize after the fifth or the sixth fax, your brain is full, you're done, and er, you know everything we tell you beyond that, one idea comes in and two more fall out. So what we're going to be doing here is we're going to send up, you know, we're going to set up at least. 10, maybe as many as 15 different little work areas where you can go to and we'll have a wind demonstration. We'll have as many as five or six different models of fans there and you'll get to see how each fan course uh, uh, is affected by wind, how each tubing configuration is affected by wind. Do a, uh, a fun little exercise that will show you the problem and then you'll be able to fix the problem and then move on. So when you see it in real life, you'll be able to instantly recognize it. And for those of you who are trainers, these are great training exercises that you can take back to your training school and allow people to learn by doing. Anyway, you. that's no, don't, don't, all don't, I have to say. You'll, you'll stay there, Colin. Um, so Ken asks about, well, can you then allow, uh, elaborate on the temperature effect on the, on the tubing uh, itself is what I think he was after, as well as temperature issues in the building itself? Well, I think it's really important. Uh, I know one time I was on the sixth floor and I took a tube and I threw it out the window, went all the way down to the floor and immediately I saw a really big rise in the pressure because it was cold outside and I had warm air inside the tube and that air was rising up six stories and it was giving me a 15 pascal pressure or so. And then as the air in the tube cooled off and became the same pressure as outdoors, then that stack effect that was inside my little piece of tubing disappeared. I think that's a great fun experiment. Anybody can try it. Uh, and just the reverse is true if we, let's say, hang a tube out the window, and let's say it's blue, which absorbs heat and so on, which is why we use red. Uh, if you throw a blue tube out the, uh, out the window on a really hot day when it's facing the sun, the air in that tube starts to heat up and you can see the pressure go up to 15, 20 pascals. 
and you go, my God, how did that happen? You really got to see this happening uh, as an individual exercise and not in the middle of a test so that when you when you see these oddball results, you go, aha, I think I must have the air is heating up in my tube, whatever. Um, stack is really a hard thing to understand logically, but if you see it practically, all of a sudden it starts to make sense. So I think that the, the one uh, takeaway, and we uh, decided as a group for part of the training that it, it wouldn't just be this how to test large buildings or how to test multifamily, but that you would leave with a uh, an immense understanding about how uh, pressures in and outside of buildings work, how pressures work in general, how do we measure them, uh, and all the different gamuts that go along with that. So I think that when people leave, they'll clearly understand how to use the software and set up fans, but I think the dynamics of understanding pressures in these buildings um, is, I think, the major uh, bonus that actually is rarely taught in any type of training. So the data logger that um, Colin mentioned a second ago um, is available, and, um, and it works on the DM2 and the DM32. And um, uh, you can easily access it by uh, going to the uh, individual uh, products and click on the gauge. And on the bottom, you can actually do learn more. And uh, below learn more on the gauges, it actually has the software and training. That's a very straightforward way to get to all of the uh, software that works on that gauge. And here's the data logger. And it basically, it's um, uh, a system where it actually will log and create a CSV file, which is similar to an Excel file. Uh, and you can determine the intervals, whether it's half second, one second. Um, and it always records channel A and B. And you can see those pressures or the results that run through your gauge. So uh, it's a very powerful tool uh, for quality assurance, quality control, or just as a, a fun learning curve as to what's happening um, with the, your setup. Uh, Joe, um, it, you do need to have the skill of being able to take the data and put it into an Excel graph. You just highlight it and ask for uh, a graph that kind of shows it to you automatically. We probably in the data logging uh, manual should show people how to do that. Uh, the software also does the same thing. Whenever you do a test, it shows you every single reading you're taking, uh, you've taken. Uh, and it does it in one eighth of a second intervals. So there's massive data, and you can see a very, very fine granularity of exactly what's going on there. That's where in this uh, in this test regime that we just finished running, we were able to see what some of the problems were by being able to analyze the data. So when you do a test, you don't say, "Well, this happened and that happened." All you do is you just take that data file, you send it to us, and we can see everything that happened during that test in uh, second by second and we can even go back and look at the weather for your region and see what the wind was blowing at that time to see if we can figure out what the heck went on. We, we know the temperatures, we know a whole lot about what was going on there. So these are very powerful tools and uh, they do take a little bit of fooling around to uh, uh, make them easy for you to work but uh, if you know how to make an Excel graph then uh, that would make it a lot easier.